these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Second reading today is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 14. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God, God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regards to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of, sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that we have been saved. What a fantastic word from God. And that's our vision verse. And it's where we get our vision from as we be continue in our series, week two in our Mac Vision series. This is what God has done. It wasn't us. It was all him. He has made us alive with Christ. Now, our souls, as we talked about last week, are, are like a tree, a tree that grows and is alive. And we're going to have a look at a video right now. Uh, and I, as you do, I want you to be kind of looking at this tree growing and thinking about the way that God is at work in your life as someone who is alive with Christ. Let's check it out.
I think it's really exciting to kind of look back on our life and think, yeah, God's been growing me, changing me in these ways, bringing more and more of this life into my life and thinking about where is it that he wants to take us. See, our vision is, in one sense, as I talked about last week, something that God has already done. If you have a faith in Jesus, you are already made alive. But at the same time, it's always, it's always changing. It's always about deepening our relationship with God. It's always about sitting more and more under the rule of God in our lives. And that's why it is a vision. It is something that we are looking forward to every day and into eternity of being alive with Christ. Today, we're looking at our first mission purpose. And as you can see on our banner, we have five of them. And we're beginning down the bottom there. And it's about know Christ. And that's represented with the, the roots of the tree. Uh, our mission purposes, each of these is how we pursue our vision to be alive with Christ. These are the everyday uh, practical things that we are doing as a church and personally to pursue being alive with Christ. Our focus, in a sense, is what wasn't seen in the video uh, and typically isn't seen when you look at a tree. It's on the roots because they are absolutely essential. From the moment the seed goes in the ground and every seed contains a portion of the roots of that tree because it's so essential. That's where it starts. And then the roots spread out. Uh, often we think of roots going deeper and deeper, actually go wider and wider because they are like an anchor in the ground for the rest of the tree. Um, I don't know if you know this, I've discovered it in recent years, but Trees will only grow as big in the branches as the roots below the ground. So in one sense, you've got tiny roots. The tree will never grow and be as fruitful as it can be. But the wider they go, the bigger the tree can be and the more fruitful it can be. And the roots are one of the main sources of sustaining the tree with water and nutrients. So vital. And so as a church that seeks to be alive with Christ, we want to be a church that knows Christ. We want to have roots that are solid and give us the strength. As the storms of this world and life hit, that, that will be our anchor. We want to be fed by God's word. And so today, as we think about know Christ, we're thinking of it in two terms. We're thinking of us, the tree as our church, and we're thinking the tree personally. And so firstly, every Sunday in our gatherings, kids and adults and on Friday nights with the youth, they are coming to know Christ. They're coming to see those roots spread and be give strength and we will be committed to God's word in every one of those gatherings as it's read as it's preached as it's sung as it's prayed but we also must know Christ personally like I said our vision this this tree represents not only the life of our church but it's not something that we just go oh, that, that's what the church does and when I turn up I'm involved in that no, this is a vision for my life and for your life. Because you are made alive with Christ and you are like this tree. And so your roots matter. Your roots as you are fed by God's word. We've spent a bit of time in Psalm 1 in uh, September. And last week I looked at Jeremiah 17. They're all about the way that God is like a stream wanting to feed the roots of the tree of our souls. 
the roots of the beginning, the start, the seed of how it is that you and I become alive with Christ. They are the thing that is gives us the strength to keep going when the storms of our life hit. You know, the bigger the tree, the more you need the anchor in the ground. But it's also how we are sustained in our faith. To know Christ is to know the glory of God. That's what know Christ is all about. To know Christ is to know the glory of God. And we're going to see that today as we think about it as a church and personally. So let's pray. God and glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray today that you would give each one of us by your spirit wisdom and revelation so that we can know you better. I pray that the eyes of our hearts will be opened so that we can know the certainty of the hope you've called us to, so that we can know the riches of your glorious inheritance worth so much more than anything in this world, and that we can know the incomparably great power that's at work in us and through us who are alive with Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Knowing Christ is a personal thing. It's not just knowing some facts. It's not just knowing some theology. It's knowing him personally because we see the face of Christ. Faces are so important. Think about the photos in your home. Most of them will have people's faces in them, won't they? Because they're the people that we know. We're connected with them. They're not some distant kind of blob. It's not just about the landscape. In fact, keeps, Cass keeps telling me, don't worry about the landscape, get in people in our family photos. Because what we're talking about here is actually that sense of, of really recognizing Jesus by his face and the way that God actually wants us to draw so close that we can almost know the details, the lines, the, the eye color. Oh, that's, that's how close God wants to bring us. This is exactly what Paul was writing about in Philippians 3. I hope as, as it was read for us, you were just struck by his, his just passion. He, his personal experience is what he's sharing there with the Philippians. And he's actually saying, yes, I've had this in, this wealth of religious experience in the past and a very high status in the religion, but it was nothing. It was nothing because I didn't know Christ. Look with me at verse 8 of that of chapter 3 of Philippians. I consider that everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Everything, everything that he'd achieved, everything that he'd done, he's saying, uh, I've just given it away. In fact, it was a, when he says, I counted it a loss, he's saying it weighed me down. It was a burden. When he says, I consider them garbage, uh, that's actually a very polite translation that the NIV has gone there, uh, it's much more extreme than that, trust me. Compared to what? Compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He doesn't say compared to the surpassing worth of Christ. That's true. Christ is worth more than anything, but see what a central place he is putting on knowing Christ. Everything is a loss. It's garbage. It's rubbish. Comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. There is nothing in this world that you or I could ever have or anyone else that will come close to the worth of knowing Christ. That's what he's saying here. It's worth giving up everything. It is the greatest treasure. How can he claim that? Well, it's because of what God has done. And now I want us to think about one of my favorite verses. It's from the letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Paul there has been writing about how because of sin and the work of Satan, everyone is blind to the light of the gospel, the, the glory of Christ. 
But then we have verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. What Paul wants us to do is take us right back to the very beginning of creation. Right, right, right back when there was nothing. There was darkness. And in that moment with just words, God has called the sun into being. He has made light in the midst of darkness. Let's kind of think about this for a second. Think about the sun. Um. Can somebody close the back door? Every second, the sun releases an estimated 384.6 yottawatts. Never heard of it before this, but uh, apparently that's a measure. It's a big one, clearly. 384.6 yottawatts of energy every second. Now, to give us some perspective here, right? Uh, one yottawatt is the equivalent energy to an atomic bomb to the hydrogen bomb, which is the, the, the most powerful. That's one yotta watt. And God, with just words, has said, let's have a son. Now, what Paul is saying is that same God with that same powerful word bringing about that incredible light has said, let light shine in your soul. That's incredible, isn't it? We should never think that it is a small thing to have God reveal himself or to have the privilege to know Christ. God did that. That's how important it is. What we're being told is God so wanted you and I to know him that he made that light shine so that we could see Christ's face, come to know him personally. This is when we see God's glory. To know Christ is to know the glory of God. That's what the roots are all about. Uh, John Owen, in his book, The Glory of Christ, it's, it's an old book. He was around a long time ago as a Christian man, and he wrote this. If we regularly beheld the glory of Christ, our Christian walk with God would become more sweet and pleasant. Our spiritual light and strength would grow daily stronger, and our lives would, be more, would more gloriously represent the glory of Christ. Death would be most welcome to us. I find that quote so challenging and comforting at the same time. Challenging because I, I need to be doing this more. But comforting because it holds that promise of yes. This is how God wants to transform my life, my soul, your life, your soul. By beholding the glory of Christ, knowing Christ more and more. That's why. That's why we are committed and one of our purposes is to know Christ. Because that's what it is to be alive with Christ. But it's also why we need the yoke of Christ. Now, I'm not talking the egg here. I'm talking about the wooden bar that they used to put over the neck of animals, beasts of burden, uh, to carry and pull heavy loads and to be able to guide them as they did it. That's the yoke. And yes, it's strange, but bear with me because we're going to get there. Why this is so important. In Matthew 11, Jesus has continued to be teaching crowds. He's been teaching them about the kingdom of God, how to enter it, how to live in it. But he goes on to tell them that actually not everybody will enter. Not everyone will know Christ. In chapter 11 there, it's on the reading on the passage, on the page. In verse 27, he says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son. 
This is why not everybody will know God, because this is not just knowledge that's just lying around everywhere. This is incredible knowledge. Did you see here that there is this closed loop from eternity? Only the Son and the Father know each other like this, truly, deeply, intimately, personally. Except, it's so good that he doesn't stop there. He says, those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. When Jesus reveals himself to us and the Father, you and I are brought into that relationship. That's what he's saying. And you don't notice it's, it's personal again. It's not revealed about God. It's revealed him. It's the very Father that Jesus is saying, I'm about bringing the little children to the Father. And then Jesus gives this incredible invitation to come to know him. Look with me at verse 28. Come to me all, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I can't think that there's a single person here who doesn't want, need rest. Whether you're weary because you've been going through hard struggle or whether you're burdened with the burdens of life, overloaded. Jesus is the one saying, you need to come to me if you want to have rest. In fact, this is why God, through the Bible, has talked about six days of work and, and one day of rest, not just a couple of hours at church, but a day we need this kind of physical rest and emotional but we're going to see it so, even so much bigger than that. But what we get here is that Jesus knows our struggles. He knows that we get weary and burdened because he lived our life. He knows it. He truly gets it. He was truly man. And so he knows our weaknesses. And it's so important that Jesus didn't stop at verse 28. Because we like the idea of coming in and having rest. Oh, Jesus is a guy, you just come and you dump your burdens and then you go away. No, it doesn't stop there. We need to hear 29 because this is crucial to having rest. Look with me, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, remember this yoke. It's this piece of timber, thick, sturdy timber that goes over the neck of the animal to be able to pull or to carry heavy loads and to guide them. It's about being a disciple or follower. In fact, the word disciple means learner. What Jesus is talking about is become a follower, a learner of me. Take that yoke. As we learn from Jesus and we learn about Jesus from him. And as he guides us, one of the important things that Jesus is telling us about himself here is that he is gentle and humble. And that's so good. He guides with grace. Jesus doesn't come with a whip as if we're just oxen go, go on. Now, he is gentle and humble. As Jesus calls us, we will find rest only in his yoke. Now, to make a yoke back in ancient times, uh, people would go to a carpenter. And they would actually bring the oxen, typically the big beasts of burden, to the carpenter to get that yoke fitted for that each, for that specific animal. They didn't kind of farm them out and you go, went to Bunnings. You came to the carpenter and on the shape of that animal, it would be planed and sanded to fit perfectly. Jesus was a carpenter. 
Very likely he fitted many yokes. He knows what he's talking about here. And this is what he means when he says my yoke is easy. He doesn't mean that it's easy in the typical sense we think, oh, nothing to it. What he's saying is it's fitted for you. It won't pinch. It won't chafe. It won't be trying to fit you into a square hole when you're a round peg. It's for you. Because what he's offering here is rest for your soul. We all get tired physically, mentally, emotionally, but Jesus is offering so much more than a holiday on the beach or, or a, a day on the couch after a busy week. This is about the rest that we really desperately need. It's rest in our souls. In fact, it's the rest that we have needed from way back in the times of Genesis. You know, when we, God made the world and there was the Garden of Eden. On the seventh day, he rested and it was meant to be ongoing rest that God would delight in his creation and us in him and he in us. And that was rest. And then we sinned. We rejected God and we rebelled against him. We walked away from it. That's what we call the fall. And from that moment, we've been restless. It was broken. The rest was broken. Our souls desperately need it. We're made for it. And so we began carrying the weight of sin, the weakness of our sin every day. Every... This is why it doesn't matter how busy your life is or not, or whether you feel like I've got it under control, I've got this, I've got the energy. It's not about that. It's so much bigger than that. It's about your soul. And the weight and the weakness of sin. But then Jesus says, Come, come to me. Take my yoke, but learn from me. And there you will find rest for your very soul. And it comes from knowing Christ. It's why those verses are so important for us to understand what's being talked about here. Only the Father knows the Son and the Son the Father and only he reveals himself. And then he says, come. Come and know me. How can we do that? Well, it's our personal Bible reading, our time with God, listening to his word. And in a sense, that the more time we spend knowing him, the more rest we will feel. If we're skipping it or just doing a drive through as we listen to the something for a couple of minutes, well, we shouldn't be surprised if we're not very rested. It's about listening to God, it's taking that time to listen and respond in prayer. It's been so encouraging to see our kids do that in kids' church. They've got their booklets. They're reading their the parts of the Bible through the week, and then they come and they share it. It's so encouraging. In our youth, a couple of terms ago, Josh had this really strange concoction of liquid poured all over him. We saw the video. Why? Because junior youth group, they are reading the Bible regularly. And as they did that through the toilet, more and more water got in. They're doing it. We ought to be doing it. It's so important that we hear what Jesus is saying here is, my burden is light. As we seek to spend time with God and his word, it's not meant to be a burden. If, we, if it feels that way, we're doing it wrong. It's not Jesus, it's us. It's not meant to be, oh, I've got to do it every day and I've got to be up at four o'clock to make sure that I do it for two hours. No. It's about taking his yoke throughout the day, but it's having that time with him and trusting that actually his burden is lighter than anything else we are actually carrying. One of the things I think can be so helpful for us to think is this, you and I are carrying such a weight if we do not spend the time with Jesus under his yoke. Because his burden is easy and it is light. Uh, when we're alive with Christ, our, our, our souls become like a compass needle. 
You know, a compass needle can't resist pointing north. That's, that's what it's all about. It can only rest when it settles on north. And that's our souls. When we're magnetized to Jesus, when we know him, we love him, we will find rest when we are pointed and fixed on him. But we will be restless. We'll be restless if we're pointed anywhere else, if we're not yoked by Christ. We need to know Christ because we live in this dark world. And so we need the light of Christ. Uh, having thought about our personal walk, now I want us to think a little bit about what we're doing as we gather here at Mac. Jesus himself said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We gather at Mac, adults and Sunday services, kids' church happening and Friday night youth. We are gathering so we can see the light of Christ shine. And it comes through his word. That's why it's so central to everything we do. And this is happening in Sprouts and Kids Church and Follow Youth and all of our Sunday services. And we need it because we go out into the world for six days a week, a world in darkness. In a sense, our time together on a Sunday is getting us ready for the other six days of the week. Because knowing Christ is practical. This light is practical. This is where I love Psalm 119, verse 105. Such a really small, simple memory verse. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. It's so practical. The light, the word of God is a lamp for my feet. Where I am standing now, whatever you and I are going through, God's word can shine into that. But he also says, and a light for my path into the future, where we need to go, decisions about directions and the future and, and attitudes and actions, and Jesus' light can shine there. So as we come together on a Sunday, we're being encouraged, we're being equipped to shine that light, not, not just in our time now, but actually you and I are being encouraged and equipped to let the light shine every day of the week. We need it. We can't go six days in the dark. Our time is to encourage us to want to open up God's word. Because the reality is an hour on a Sunday is not going to help us answer all of our questions about things like sex and gender, sickness and death, how to be in relationships where we're committed and we work through conflict, what to do in our different work situations. And by work, I mean paid and unpaid, as well as what do we say? What do we think about the wars going on in the world? And so many more things. Jesus is the light. His word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. And so we gather together to know how we too can open up the word during the week and in our lives because they're all so different and allow it to shine, to give us answers and understanding and to be able to share that light with others. Because to know Christ is to know the glory of God. So let's rest in him and be led by his light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, great is your love and rich is your mercy. You may have made us alive with Christ when we were dead in sin. And so help us to be passionately alive with Christ in our homes and the highlands, in all our gatherings, and about taking the gospel to the world. So your grace to us in Christ is made known and your kingdom is grown.